Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Doe Fellowship Discussion Series. I am Michelle L. Watley, your 2021 Doe Fellow, and I'm so excited to be here in person with you today to talk about all of the issues impact of politics this year, last year, a couple years before, and in 2020 and beyond. Uh, as a Doe Fellow for the Dole Institute of Politics, I have the distinguished pleasure of pulling together a discussion series of my choosing, pulling together speakers of my choosing to discuss the current issues impacting politics and the things that you need to be aware of as we move forward in politics here in the United States. I am the founder of the GRIO Group, a strategic communications and political advocacy firm, and I come by that work through years of experience on the political campaign trail and strategic communications, having worked for Senator Bernie Sanders in his presidential campaign and senior national leadership and campaigns and initiatives across the Midwest. In 2017, I was named the American Association for American uh, Politics uh, 40 under 40 and by campaign elections, their rising star for 2017. I'm the first black female operative to have gotten both national awards in the same year. And the Campaigns and Election Award is an award that has been given to the likes of Donna Brazil, George Stephanopoulos, Laura Ingram, and Alex Castanellos, who worked for Senator Baldo in his presidential campaign. So I bring a wealth of experience in political campaigning, but I also bring experience in advocacy. I'm the founder of Shirley's Kitchen Cabinet, a nonpartisan nonprofit named for none other than Shirley Chisholm. Clap your hands if you know who Shirley Chisholm is. Do we know who Shirley Chisholm is? <laughs> well, to be sure that we are all talking from the same breadth of experience, Shirley Chisholm is the first black woman to run for president on a major party ticket and the first black woman to be elected to Congress. Through our nonprofit, we work to amplify the voices of power in black women here in the Kansas City region so that they can be better advocates on behalf of the issues that matter to them. So I am honored to be named a Dole Fellow uh, with the Dole Fellow Institute, an institute named for uh, the Congressman Robert Dole. And today we are going to talk about what's the matter with American politics. <laughs> so much has happened in the last four years, from fake news uh, to Presidents 45 and 46, protests and a pandemic, social media, the leadership of black women, but we still see an opportunity to create change and we still see an opportunity to make democracy work better for the American public and we will be discussing how that can be done today. In keeping with the Doles Institute's efforts to come into the digital age, guns a blazing, our sessions are hybrid. With the exception of the sessions today, some of our speakers are joining us virtually, but this session is also being live streamed. If you're joining us from YouTube at the Dole Institute's YouTube page and want to join in on the discussion, you can send your questions to dolequestions, with an S, at ku.edu. So be sure to send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu so you can join the discussion and make sure that you get your voice heard during this important discussion about communications and politics. Joining me today is a distinguished panel of experts who just happen to be all lovely women. That's just the icing on the cake. And so, first of all, we have the one, the only, Julie Jones joining us. Julie is a broadcast professional with over 20 years of experience in radio right here in Kansas City. As the host of the Midday Party, Julie brings her passion for community issues, trending topics, political perspectives, celebrity interviews, and a humorous delivery of entertainment news to listeners every single week. Julie is a graduate, bear with me, Julie is a graduate of the University of Missouri in Kansas City with a BA in communications, and she earned her master's degree in marketing from Webster University. Fun fact, Julie wanted to originally be an accountant. Math is her bailiwick. Um, but she took a course in radio and was hooked ever since. You can catch Julie Jones at the Midday Party weekdays from 10 to 3 on KPRS FM Hot 103 Jams, the oldest black-owned radio station in the United States. 
Welcome, Julie Jones. Thank you for coming out today. And to my left, speaking of interesting uh, professional pivots, I have Allison Kite. Allison is an environmental reporter for the Missouri Independent and the Kansas Reflector. She is a graduate, a 2016 graduate of none other than the University of Kansas. Right here. <laughs> right here at the University of Kansas. She has covered state government in both Topeka and Jefferson City and was most recently the city hall reporter for the Kansas City Star. Thank you so much for joining us, Allison. Thanks for having me. Yes. And last but not least, we have Mary Sanchez, a Kansas City resident. She is nationally syndicated as a columnist with the Tribune Content Agency, specializing in Latin American issues, immigration, race, politics, education, and culture. Her columns appear in publications across the nation and internationally. She's a frequent contributor to uh, Kansas City's PBS station, appearing weekly on news shows, including This Week in Kansas City. And for a number of years, Mary served as the Metro columnist for the Kansas City Star, and she served on the Kansas City Star's editorial board. Her work began to get recognized and has been recognized repeatedly throughout her career with honors from the National Clarion Award, the American Society of Newspaper Editors, and the Missouri Press Foundation, which named Mary the best serious columnist for 2017. Mary is also another fun fact, a 2019 Quattrone Investigative Reporting Fellow with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at SUNY, the City University of New York. The Quattrone Fellowship is designed to encourage investigative journalism uh, that explores grievous errors and mistakes made by justice authorities using the analytical approach typically utilized in the medical and aviation sectors. Her work in her proposed project with this fellowship involves investigating the systemic failures that allowed for the incarceration of innocent people, which I think is a very timely topic if you look at what's been going on with the news and death row inmates being put to death without having clemency although there's a question about their innocence um, as we get closer to those dates. So thank you so much for joining us, Mary. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started again. If you're watching us live, be sure to send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. And this is a question for all of you. You all come from very different perspectives and different realms um, within the traditional media, mass media sectors, whether it be journalism or broadcast or, or TV or the like. From your perspective, what role has communications played in politics historically in the past years? And if we look at it, uh, look at the timeline on a grand scale, TV, for instance, has been pivotal to candidates running for office, has even shifted the uh, candidate landscape for presidential candidates who, at the invention of TV and the showcasing of presidential debates on TVs, who have been able to um, ride the coattails of great debates that were won on television. When we look at Howard Dean's campaign for president, his use of email, we see where communications played a role. When you look at former President Obama's use of social media in communications to win his election, that played a pivotal role. And even if you look at former President Trump's use of Twitter, that has definitely shifted the communications landscape in politics and campaigns. So from your very uh, different perspectives and your respective sectors, what role has communications, mass communications played um, in political politics and government? And I will open it to whoever wants to take the question first. <laughs> Who wants to start? Allison? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think that communications plays a, a hugely important role in politics, um, and I think it's changed a lot in the last couple decades. I would guess that I am of the age that I was kind of among the last kids cutting out newspaper articles for... Um, you know, reports in school, and that kind of started to shift online throughout my childhood. So I think the, the biggest change in communications in the last couple decades has been um, the diversity of sources. You know, um, it used to be to get information about a campaign, your options were your local TV stations, your local newspapers, um, and now campaigns have the ability to speak directly to voters. 
um, in a way that can be really powerful. You know, you mentioned that um, former President Obama, former President Trump, both use social media to reach their bases. It also leaves reporters sometimes feeling like we are chasing what's happening online. So um, it can make our jobs more difficult, um, but also can be used as this very powerful tool to reach people who might not be um, tuned in with their local paper, or their local TV station. Mm -hmm. A traditional newspaper journalist. I work on radio. We're music intensive. You got to get in and out. People want to be entertained. Yet, radio is still a very viable uh, platform for candidates to get their messages out. I know when political season starts, I'm about to hear some ads. Sometimes I'm like, okay, whew, can't listen to that anymore. But it, <laughs> communication, mass media is so important because not only does it engage people who might be disengaged, it sends the initial message. Somebody will get an idea about a candidate before they even look at their policies based off commercials. Now, is that a scary thing? Yes, it can be. Which is why Michelle and I talk about this all the time. Candidates and political campaigns have to talk to people on the ground. For us as an urban station, our audience is predominantly black. However, we're not a monolith. You have different perspectives of life, uh, different parties, while you might think, most black people are Democrat. Well, you do have a sect that are con still conservative, you know, from Reconstruction. Black people initially started off in the Republican Party. So there's been black conservatives. You have some that are going more independent. You have your Green Party, Libertarian. So when we speak about politics, we may not be able to have the range that you would see on cable news, but it's very important that we get out the message that, number one, voting is important. Number two, research the candidates. Because even though media platforms are very useful in getting people involved in the political process, but they're going to tell you what they want you to know about the campaign and the person running for office, right? So you still got to be your own political nerd and dig a little bit. But yet media is so important. That's why everybody buys the commercials. That's why when we do platforms, people come out. Um, working with Michelle and Shirley's Kitchen Cabinet, we got people to come out, different candidates, to talk specifically to black women about their issues, their platform, how they're going to address the issues that concern us. So media is very important, and of course, social media, because now, and I get that, because I go on the Twitters too to get information. <laughs> because when you see a hashtag, I can literally wake up and see what's going on in the political world thanks to Twitter. That can be a blessing and a curse, because it gets you the information quick, but we'll get into this later about what information is real, fake news, misinformation, and willful disinformation. So while mass media is important and will continue to be so for getting out political messages, we also too have to filter what we view, what we take in, when we make our decisions. And that's what media is for. Well, and Julie, what I think is interesting about broadcast or radio is if you look historically at the invention of mm -hmm. television and mass mm -hmm. communications through television, what you would find is political debates for presidential candidates would take place and a candidate would win by uh, the, the viewers on mm -hmm. TV, but then when they would poll the, the listeners on radio, oftentimes it would be the mm -hmm. other candidate who won uh, the audience on radio. The mediums are very different. What you see from a candidate is very different mm -hmm. from what you hear on the can yes. from a candidate um, when you can't see their face. And so mm -hmm. I think that also speaks to why radio mm -hmm. is equally important. Radio yes. reaches an audience that TV sometimes does not, and mm -hmm. it has a very different effect on mm -hmm. listeners, voters, um, yes. who are listening mm -hmm. to the debates or any other information that they may get from radio. Every Monday, Mayor Q calls into our morning show, The Morning Grind, the shameless plug, 5.30 a.m. But you can actually hear the mayor, not in press conference mode or in city mode, but he's talking to you like he's talking to the brother at the barber shop or one of his cousins. So you really get the core of who he is. And that's why radio is important, because it gives you a chance to have a conversation that you don't have to be polished for. You don't have to have all your cards in a row and make sure you're looking at the camera like this and you're standing like this. So that's kind of the... That's an advantage, I think, that radio has. But of course, you know, with the Communications Act, we have to give equal time. You may not hear a lot of candidates on, unless during political seasons, we do do candidate forums on air, but we offer it to everyone. So for those who are like, why do you have them on? Well, we offer it to everyone because we have to. If they turn it down, then they miss the opportunity. But missing the opportunity, I will say this, can cost you voters. I agree, I agree. Mary, you've been in uh, mass media for over 30 years, so I think that you've been able to see the shift and the shift that 
communications has played in politics from your perspective? What has historically been the role of mass communications in politics? And, any, and can you speak to any shifts that you may have noted? Well, I think to even understand where we're headed and then to make those conversations about what needs to be done and what, you know, how the public can engage, you do have to kind of acknowledge the role, both good and bad, that particularly mainstream print media played in the past. And it's very much gatekeepers. I mean, I even tweeted something off of a Pew Research um, study about what the public wants of media. You know, where's the, what did I say, where's Walter Cronkite for 2021? Because people still want to receive news from someone that they trust, a source that they trust. The problem is no one trusts media anymore. And media becomes this media conglomerate they, um, I operate very, very differently having come from a print journalism background than someone who's younger might have or someone who totally came up through like their own experience of making their online news magazine themselves. Um, I used to always say that I could get fired for what TV used to do. And that's true. I mean, it used to be back in the day the standards of mainstream print journalism were very, very high on the ethics, the conflicts, everything. That doesn't mean that we got everything right at all or that we spoke to everyone. Um, you know, I still think so much is, as much as everything changes with social media, they're still the same. Candidates will tell you, and it's already been somewhat alluded to here, you have to go door to door. You have to actually meet people. You can only get so far in a campaign by the big money, whether it's dark money, whatever. Um, you can only get so far by being attached to, say, your predecessor in office. You can only get so far on anything. You've got to, to bring out the voters. It is still a very personal relationship. People vote for someone that they feel good about, which we can get into this too. I mean, female candidates, that's what hurts them because yes. you have to like a woman to vote for her. You don't have to like a man, this is polling wise. People will vote for a man that they dislike. They generally tend to not vote for a woman that they dislike. That's a problem in that it's just a differential of how, you know, I guess it could be a, a plus, depends on how you see it. Um, but anyway, I do think that overall, you need to kind of just understand where things were and there were, media was much more the gatekeeper and now we're questioned for good reasons. I mean, and I think no apologies for what print, some of the calamities that we've caused, some of the, um, the it breaks my heart, the implosion of some of the big papers, including you know, my former employer, the Kansas City Star, the financial struggles. It is very damaging to politics, to democracy. However, we built some of our own icebergs that we hit. So it's no woe is me kind of sorrow thing. It's just forward, how are we gonna manage going on? I think it's a little bit of both with the emergence of new media, yeah. which includes blogs, websites, uh, social media platforms and the like, and the um, new opportunities and challenges mm -hmm. that new media brings, opportunities in that you can get news fast and that anybody can be a news maker at this point. Uh, but challenges in that anybody can be a newsmaker, right, without having to go through and, and the exercise in the same rigor that a traditional journalist is expected to go through in order to bring news forward into the public uh, creates both blessings and curses. And when you talk about uh, the challenges of traditional um, media, such as newspapers and, and the both the good and the bad, I think that what we're seeing as of late is a lot of atonement for some of that. When I think of the Kansas City Star in their most recent article about the reporting of black Kansas Cityans and their apology to black Kansas Cityans and their formation of an advisory board, you're starting to see some of that. But you all alluded to new media and its role in political communications. And during the first two discussions of the series, I tried to interweave some of the work that
uh, Congressman Bob Dole uh, conducted as a congressman, and this is no exception uh, for this discussion. I did research and found an archive of his different constituent newsletters and writings and communications to constituents, and you can find those here at, at KU and on the website. But I also found an archived page from his 1996 presidential campaign and I found his platform on what he called technology and the internet, which is very interesting to read in 1996. And in that platform, he states that the openness and decentralized nature of the internet demands a new approach to policy making that recognizes the unique characteristics of the new medium. This is back in 96. And some of those platforms included the rejection of handy hand, heavy handed big government regulations of cyberspace. Mm -hmm. That's interesting considering. Facebook <laughs> right? this week, yeah. Facebook, mm -hmm. right? um, and that Americans have the, should and will have the freedom to use the internet without government intrusion. He also believed in one of his platform tenets was that he would preserve and protect American citizens' right to privacy and the need for secure communications. And he believed that parents should take responsibility for the material that their children view. He also believed that uh, American people knew best how to manage their own lives and their own computers. I think that uh, Bob Dole could not have possibly imagined a new media digital world that we experience today with TikTok and Facebook and cyber hacking and laptops and iPads like this one and classrooms and cell phones that are mini computers. I think we're in a very different world um, digitally with new media than we were in 1996. Let's. I'd like to dive in a little more about the role of new media in, in politics, again, which is website, blogs, video sharing platforms, digital apps, and social media. What has been the role of new media in shaping politics today? And how have traditional or legacy mass media communications um, platforms, such as newspaper, TV, and broadcast, how have you all been impacted, and how have you had to navigate this new space. And Mary, you alluded to it a little bit, mm -hmm. but if you could go a little deeper into how new media has impacted uh, newspapers, for instance. It's more the instant, um, you know, instantaneous knowledge that anyone can gather. You know, we may find out about a court order and get a hold of it faster than other people, but the general public is going to still be on our tails on that. You know, you have to very much, I think even more so, be versed in the content in explanatory journalism, in being fair and honest, um, because the public has access in ways that they didn't used to, which I say is good. I mean, that's democracy. It's like we're, you have more tools now. You know, you have more information. The problem is it's just overwhelming. And like you said, anyone can put out anything. And what you don't want to do is, you know, retweet something that is false. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, within print journalism, there was conversations early on about, okay, what is more important? Do we get it first or do we get it right? And some editors would say, well, you can always change it later which is true, you can always correct, and that's what, when we talk about truth, we can talk about this. I mean, truth can shift as you find out more information. That doesn't mean that it was necessarily wrong in a cruel way before, but we found out more, we learned more, and the public has to understand that. And I think kind of that, the paper of record, you know, by God, and once it was printed, and that was the only place it was gonna be important, that needed to seep away. And how do you become much more nimble and move within the community as the community learns to use Twitter? Although, that's another one. I mean, and particularly within political reporting, a certain segment of society is hyper-focused on it. A small segment. You cannot write just for that segment. You just can't. Or report, or produce, or online, or however you're gonna you know, deliver the content. Um, you have to realize that just because Twitter's saying it, mm -hmm. eh, about 98% of the population then right. isn't. Right. Or they're completely unaware with what's trending right now. And frankly, they could give a darn. Yeah. 
So you've got to balance not only being the first, if possible, but also being correct, correct and adhering to traditional um, modes of processes that have Check been it. embedded in journalism. What, do you, what are some of those processes, fact-checking, and other criteria that you have to hit as a journalist in order for you to um, maintain the standard of writing and news reporting that has been um, traditionally thought of when you think of journalism and newspaper writing? Some of that's almost easier with internet because we have so much more access to everything. You know, I can call up court decisions and see the whole thing immediately. Um, it's easier in a way, but then you also have to just keep checking yourself. I mean, I, I think the essence of a good journalist is that they are somewhat humble and they do check things out and then double check it. I mean, the old adage was always, if your mother said it, what, check it twice or something like that. There you go. Yeah, it's like, but doesn't she? <laughs> I'm going to look that up. I'm going to yeah, sure look my that mother one loves up. me see if it's on Wikipedia or something. It's still the same. It's mm -hmm. just that you have more tools to do it and that the flood of information is just massive right now. Mm -hmm. And I think what journalism can do very well, and we can talk about the role of nonprofit journalism and collaboratives, which are really emerging, and we have many in this area that um, are really starting to come together to try and fill some voids that have been created with the financial struggles of print media. Um, you know, so that's an exciting thing that is happening, but it's, it's just so much. I mean, I think people, the average person is busy. They don't have time. I mean, it's ridiculous how many newspapers I take online. I don't have anything delivered anymore. It's all online. But I mean, I read the LA Times, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, I'll read The Atlantic. I think there's, there's one in Harlem um, that deals with Haitians that I'm, you know, right now, I, come, I bounce in and out of them for different reasons sometimes, but Chicago Tribune. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a massive amount. No one who's a normal person does that, <laughs> you know? I mean, you don't, I don't have time for it, and it's my job, you know? So how do you barter with all that access of information and make what I'm gleaning something that's useful to the public. Well, Allison, I'm going to kick that over to you because you raise a good point, Mary. How does one take in all of the information that's available and ensure that they're fully informed when there's so much information to look at and when, quite frankly, social media makes it easy for you to cherry pick the information you want to look at with clickbaits and, and headlines that draw you in, if you read a few headlines, you may feel that you have the sense of what is going on in the news and what the current events are. And if I scroll through my Facebook for half an hour, I could get the sense or the feeling that I have all the information I need about what's going on in current events. How do you, as a reporter and as an emerging leader in, in journalism, how do you combat that? Well, I think um, you're right. It can feel, you know, with just a little bit of scrolling in your Facebook or your Twitter feed, like you are up to date. But um, ever since Twitter changed from being a chronological timeline to an algorithm, which I'm still upset about, um, you know, you're being served things that probably um, confirm your preconceived biases. You have to fight the algorithm to read um, articles that might not conform to what you already believe. So you have to be somewhat intentional about the information that you seek out and, you know, read the things that you agree with, but also the things that you don't to kind of challenge your own beliefs and, and be able to develop a more fully formed belief. Um, and I think what, what Mary was talking about, about kind of just the onslaught of information out there can also, as a reporter, um, make it difficult to tell what people actually care about because you're just being bombarded with what people who are um, extremely online care about. Um, but that's not necessarily what, you know, your neighbor cares about or what your parents care about or whatever. I, I know during COVID, like my, my parents, whenever there was, especially in the beginning when we were still learning about the virus, whenever there was like new information, they would call me and be like, okay, what's like, what does the science say? And I'm like, I, I'm not a scientist, but, um, you know, you have to um, kind of just figure out um, what the people around you actually care about. And it might seem like 
X, Y, or Z topic is really important based on your Twitter feed, and then you might go, you know, down to your bar and talk to the bartender, and they have no idea that's going on. Um, so I think I'm going on a tangent here, but um, I think <laughs> I think you have to be, you know, really intentional about the kinds of information that you read, and uh, you know, just ask yourself periodically, am I seeing this all over the internet because this many people care about it or because the people who care about it are really loud? Well, you brought up another good point, Allison, in the role of word of mouth and, and our influencers within our personal circle. Research shows that during political campaigns, for instance, hearing from someone that's close to you or a trusted voice that's close to you about a candidate or an issue that's important could be the most um, impactful, influential mm -hmm. factor in who you actually vote for or how you feel about an issue. And I think what makes radio very special is that your radio DJs for local radio um, are people who live in your community, people you might see at the grocery store, people who you listen to on the morning drive into work or the drive back home. And so those uh, professionals are people that you have a connection to and they are a trusted voice. But again, new media has likely shifted broadcast with podcasts. With podcasts, you can hear from leaders from across the globe on a number of issues. You can go back and listen to uh, podcasts and hear what was discussed, and that can influence your thoughts and how you um, feel about particular issues. For you, Julie, how has podcasts and other new media platforms uh, that have uh, encroached on the traditional broadcast space, how has that impacted your work and your reporting? Well, one thing that um, I would say, access is the biggest. So for us with music, people getting access to their music, but also information. What makes, uh, so we've had to shift. So you have to stay in front of stuff. Do I scroll social media to see what people are talking about, to know what they're interested in? Of course, but the difference is, and I always tell people this, your favorite podcaster who lives in New York, they're not gonna be on the ground in Kansas City. We can be personally reached we will be at community events. If you want us to come to your school, somebody's like, well, what about Charlemagne? Charlemagne is not coming to your school. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you call us, we will be there. So I think the advantage for traditional media is just presence. But you are competing with not only big money media, but these people who are getting attention for their podcasts, no matter how outlandish it is, because we know sometimes outlandishness draws attention and it can actually make people think, although heaven forbid, <laughs> some of it you gotta be like, whoa, um, and we have to remember with social media that people can get, like you all have said, there's just so much information at once. But here's what we have to remember. Twitter's not the real world. And you see people who are on social media like, this is it, and this is what everybody's thinking, and everybody around me, and this is what's happening. No, Chicken Little, the sky is not falling like that. <laughs> so I think with traditional media, we really have to be, particularly those of us who are on the ground, we have to be intentional about connecting with our audience and letting them know that we are present, not only so we can give voice to the issues that concern them, but bring on people, the experts, who can speak to that as well. As you discuss the role of traditional media, what, is, what comes to mind, and even reading uh, Congressman Dole's platform, is mm -hmm. the role of parents mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. students and children consume media. And it's easy to mm -hmm. say, well, parents should just watch what children consume, watch what's on their laptops and iPads and cell phones. But these things are hard to track. And young people have been very oh, yeah. you know, astute and effective in utilizing these platforms to not only organize in politics, but mm -hmm. to engage in activities that we might consider outlandish. outlandish. There's a TikTok uh, challenge called the Slap a Teacher Challenge going around. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is very popular and that's trending, Slap a Teacher. Yeah. How, do, how, do, how does a parent prevent their child from seeing this, this challenge on their cell phone or iPad mm -hmm. or their laptop mm -hmm. at school? How does a parent mm -hmm. control right. a child's consumption of that type of yeah. media when it's so pervasive, mm -hmm. so easily accessed? Right. And what is the role of not only parents but other entities mm -hmm. in um, safeguarding or mm -hmm. serving as gatekeepers if necessary to information. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Dole mentioned that it wasn't mm -hmm. the role of government to be heavily regulating social media, mm -hmm. but we have seen Facebook and other mm -hmm. social media uh, leaders 
uh, be, you know, grilled in front of the Senate for their practices, how they handle misinformation and the like. What is the mm -hmm. role of not only parents, but mm -hmm. other entities in mm -hmm. kind of safeguarding what information not only our children consume, but the information that comes to us? I think parents' role, first of all, have to know what's going on. There's some parents, what is the TikTok? Well, you better know if you have a kid and you better know what they're looking at. That's as much as you can safeguard. Because as much as we can get into our son's phone to see what he's up to, I, I, don't, I don't know what you see from your peers. I don't know what you see in the hallways. But it's important to have those conversations. So I think parents' job is to have the conversation, to know what's going on, and create that dialogue with your kid, particularly the dangers of getting involved in certain social media situations. We know the issue of pass around news. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but that's actually considered child porn. And even though you're in high school, you can get in trouble. Just having authentic, honest dialogues and continue to have them. We, we have to do that, we can't run from it. And I wish entities would be more protective, to be honest, with these challenges, ridiculous challenges. We wanna talk about our freedoms, but with freedom comes responsibility. There's absolutely no way, some of these challenges I've seen, drinking crazy stuff, and they're so popular, mm -hmm. and people putting their health at risk, and not only promoting the assault of a teacher, so while I'm into personal freedom and making your own choices, I do believe that there is a responsibility of big tech to watch out for our children and promoting things that are dangerous to us as a society, which would be slapping a teacher or seeing if you can drink something strange and concoction that can land you in ER. It's ridiculous. You know, that comes up in these conversations all the time is that it was different when I did stupid things as a young person. There was no documentation. There was no documentation, <laughs> partly, that lasted. There's so much about social media now, and frankly, I've talked to my nieces and nephews about it. What you put out there may chase mm -hmm. you in ways that the dumb things that I did in South Kansas City, a couple things, <laughs> you know. Just one or two. Just one, well, there was a spray painting of that bridge on Blue River Road. <laughs> It was really stupid, nothing even, yeah, don't know. Um, but that's, you know, it's like, and I can say it now and laugh about it, right. but there are things that young people are posting now that mortify me for how it may chase them down the line, mm -hmm. even getting into college, a job, whatever, or be twisted and turned against them. I mean, I mentioned this issue with pornography, there are some of the things I mean, anyone has the tools to manipulate and change photos. You know, there are photos with young children that get put out there, and you're forever part of that pedophile, massive network that is online. So there, there are new roles and challenges and morals and ethics that have to come into play just understanding how far our technology can take us as wonderful as it is, there are limits. And I mean, I think that is what communities decide, you know, what are my limits here? What is good within my household? What is good within my school district? Again, it gets back to politics, you know, why you vote for who you vote for on your city council, why you vote for who you vote for on your school board, all of that. It's, it's the, so different, but yet it's the same. You know, what type of communities do we want? How do we use our system to promote those voices, those issues? And one of the things that did come to mind too when we were talking about just differing voices, um, one of the things that I think is really, really important right now for media to do is to listen to those conversations and interrupt with good information what is wrong. I mean, there are so many terms and I've dealt with race, immigration, and criminal justice for years now. Just within those, the way people are talking about, even some things in Kansas City this week, both sides I see twist in reality with terminology. I think strong media needs to not do what we used to call both sidesism, yeah. where we just quote this person and then we got this side, and that we're done. No, you need to point out what is accurate, what is correct. Who is twisting, using terminology, sticking them in people's heads by repeating it over and over again, defund the police, or we have no one to hire. I mean, police staffing is incredibly complicated. 
incredibly complicated. And some of the things that are being said are just, they're, they're a twisting of reality. It's, almost, it, it's a, almost a different space. Is it absolutely incorrect? Well, you're really not being truthful. And that's a space that journalists need to work in. I think ethical, strong journalists need to work in to help communities understand what they need to understand and know an issue enough so that then you make your decision. But you make your decision because you have been given good, solid information. And I want to make sure we get back to that. But Allison, I wanted to tap you. We talked about young people posting outlandish things on social media, but adults have been guilty of that too. And uh, posting information that some may view as not uh, exactly truthful and entities outside of government have stepped in and shut down accounts, i.e. Mm -hmm. former President Trump yeah. and his account being shut down on, on Twitter. We talked about the role in government. We talked about the role of parents. What is the role of these social media platforms in being gatekeepers of information? And is that between these entities and government, is that heavy-handed regulation of technology, the internet, and social media platforms? That is a, that's a big question, very weighty <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, I think that we talked about traditional media previously having been the gatekeepers, and I think that that ha was detrimental in some ways where we weren't hearing from certain voices. But at the same time, um, you know, we as journalists have um, a really high standard before we can print something. Um, you know, I, if I write something outlandish into an article, my editor is going to be like, um, are you sure that this is accurate? Um, so I think that, you know, the, the one way to look at like a Facebook Twitter, TikTok, whatever, is like the newspaper publisher of our day, where they do have a responsibility to slow down or stop misinformation or um, inappropriate content. When, when I was in college, it was like, make sure you don't have any red solo cups in your pictures or you'll never get a job. Like it was like even more, <laughs> it was like even more paranoid to be like, this is iced tea in this red solo cup. Um, <laughs> And it's gotten, since I graduated, I feel like the that uh, leash has gotten longer. I feel like young people are posting things, particularly to TikTok, that I would never have dreamed of when I was job hunting. But um, so I, I think that uh, it's hard to say what exactly the role of those organizations should be, but I think that we do have um, a real problem where there's not the same level of accountability for the way that misinformation travels on Facebook or Twitter as there is if if I printed something egregiously incorrect. You know, I, I would have to issue a correction. I could, if it was really bad, presumably lose my job. Uh, I don't think that that Twitter and Facebook seem to be held as ac accountable for that misinformation spread as an individual reporter would be. So oh, how, how you do that uh, is above my pay grade, I hope. Um, but I think that, that there certainly should be a role there. Well, yeah, uh -huh. with the hearings mm -hmm. with Facebook. The other thing is you're gonna start seeing more of this coming through the courts. Um, media law is one of the things, anyone that majors in journalism, you end up taking a media law course. And there's a lot of these things that just haven't been decided yet because, you know, things are coming at us at whole different levels. You know, what is, what's going to be the standard? Um, you know, it's like what the standard used to be for pornography, you know, it's like, well, you know it when you see it kind of thing, a community standard. Um, there used to be issues. And I can, this came up in Kansas City as it has in many towns that, you know, when you have a blogger, and they put something out there that's absolutely heinous. Some pretty nasty stuff can get posted. And then other people tag on, who's responsible for the defamation? Can you sue for that? I don't know. I mean, it's an open legal question still. There are more cases that have been coming forward, but eventually some of that, like some of the big issues like abortion is heading towards the courts again to a Supreme Court, that's the whole issue is trying to People want to push it up back there again to challenge Roe v. Wade. I think some of these things are also going to begin to percolate up. Um, and it, you could do a whole series, frankly, just with some media law professionals about where things are right now and perhaps even what they forecast occurring. 
um, partly by the shape of the courts, who's on the courts, what's happening, whether Facebook takes um, some acknowledgement more so than they've wanted to for Instagram and some of the damage that can be caused by it, as well as the good. Or whether Twitter is going too far. I think that what you're seeing with new media is that it is an incubator and breeding ground for not only misinformation and accurate information or information that's not vetted, but it becomes a breeding ground for like-minded people to come together and organize right. and engage in an activity depending on what side you're on that can be good or mm -hmm. bad. You saw young people organize to um, buy out all of the tickets of a Trump rally uh, during the presidential mm -hmm. election season so that no one would show up. But you also uh, saw people organize on social media like young people did on social media for the Trump rally. You saw them organize um, to protest and essentially um, lead into the situation that happened on January 6th. Yes. All of that organizing took place on the dark web and in social media platforms. And so it'd be yeah. interesting to see where government lands and regulating social media platforms. Well, look at foreign government mm -hmm. interference in our elections. Yes, that too. I mean, that's proven. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, if anything, that should be, I mean, I care what happens to individual, particularly young people and how it's gonna affect them long term. I was given much more you know, granted, I was not a perfect child, but I was pretty straight laced. <laughs> All I cared about was journalism and running track and cross country. Um, but I feel for young people now. It's a hard issue to navigate. And young women, young men are being hit with all sorts of horrific things. I mean, it, that's wrong. I mean, as an older person, I'm mortified by some of it. Um, but then again, it's. I don't, it's just such a changing fast. We're going to have to figure it out, not on the fly, but with a lot of good thought and, frankly, input from young people, too. I think often people my age speak of, you know, we need to hear from them, what, what do you think? What do you feel? What do you want from, you know, all sorts of different, uh, you know, we don't mention Facebook. Nobody younger uses Facebook. I mean, they just, right. they don't, <laughs> you know, and that, so there's a marketplace driven, which I think Dole would understand, mm -hmm. um, of how that's shifting too. Remember MySpace? People under a certain age wouldn't. I mean, that one went away. Well, Facebook, I think, is being weeded out. Facebook? Twitter's going to. Yes, Facebook is being weeded out. I mean, TikTok is it. You talk about MySpace, how many people remember Black Planet? I was um, thinking Black Planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But right. I think uh, Mary brings up a good point. Whatever is going to happen in our courts, I think it will impact how social media, the restrictions. I do think when we see a detriment to the life of people, that you can plan something that can be deadly or harmful to someone. Like we saw on January 6th. Absolutely. Yes. Or even misinformation about coronavirus and people taking all sorts of stuff. You trying to clean your air conditioner, but you're taking this for... Uh, COVID, when you're putting people's lives in danger, there has to be some type of filter. You know, we talk about government overreach, but then again, we're talking about human beings, human life, quality of life. And with young people, what happens to them later on because a screenshot from 2000, mm -hmm. and now you're trying to live your life. So it will be interesting to see what happens. We could continue this discussion on it's this topic. Like that could be its own panel. Yeah. But if you're watching us virtually and you want to join in on the discussion, we're getting ready to go into our Q and A section here shortly. Be sure to email your questions to Dole Questions Q U E S T I O N S at K U dot E D U. Um, we're going to keep this moving along. You all have mentioned misinformation more than once. And <laughs> <laughs> along with the emergence of new media, we have also developed a new type of news. Mm -hmm. Fake news. Oh, God. <laughs> what is fake news <laughs> opposed to real news? <laughs> and how did that term develop? And I will open that up to anybody who wants to take that. Now we know where the term came from. Fake news is just patently false. Or someone who wants to deny the truth about them. They don't like it. It's fake news. Dub it fake news. Misinformation sometimes is really not meant to harm. People find out information that they think is real, and they spread it. It's misinformation. It's not intentional to do anything to you. The problem becomes disinformation, which I think fake news is like the first cousin of misinformation. 
and the overall big mama auntie, the dangerous one is disinformation. When you're taking false information or misinformation purposely to target people to cause them harm or delay. For instance, um, and Reese Colbert did a great piece on this in the GRIO, I believe it was in August, about the Stop Vaccine Blacks campaign. And people thought it was actually, you know, because you see these Black Lives Matter signs or these black faces, mm -hmm. they thought it was black people concerned about black people. This was a plan on 4chan that was not by black people to cause black people to doubt getting vaccinated to keep them uh, or to, we know that black people have been impacted by coronavirus and the health disparities haven't helped with the outcomes, but to keep them from getting vaccinated. Disinformation is dangerous when you perpetrate on people to cause them intentional harm. We saw it in the elections. We know um, from Senate hearings that there were these Russian you know, troll farms where the term digital blackface came up, where these accounts looked like they were owned by black people and they were going far right or trying to depress the vote and say, stay home. And you know, you guys own the plantation when you're with the Democrats. Come to find out, these weren't black people at all. That was purposeful disinformation. It is one thing to have a political belief and to stand on that platform whether you're a black, Latina, white, female, male, but to purposely go after a group of people to cause them to want to stay home or to spread candidate disinformation. That is purposely, purposely dishonest and it's something we are gonna to have to be watchful for in 2022, I promise. But how do you determine what that line is? Mm -hmm. uh, you speak about, and you bring mm -hmm. up a, an, an issue that makes me think of what happened in the 2018 elections in Missouri, uh, particularly mm -hmm. during the Senate race, mm -hmm. in which there was radio advertising that started very early Lord, in the yes. campaign season in June before the election. Uh, radio ads were bought out to the tune of $300,000 on black radio yeah. to encourage uh, black voters to not necessarily vote for Republicans, but to not vote at all. Yes. And so these ads played on well-known um, fears within the black mm -hmm. community of uh, men being locked up mm -hmm. for, you know, for arbitrary reasons and other kind of closely held fears in the black community to get black voters to not vote for Claire McCaskill and to not vote at all. And right. these ads were bought by a Republican mm -hmm. operative in, mm -hmm. you know, in an effort yeah. to help the Republican candidate. Mm -hmm. They were bought very early. The advertising went out in June. I don't think that Senator Claire McCaskill put out ads until yeah. uh, October of the year before yeah. the election season. Yeah. And so where does that mm -hmm. line exist? Is that type of advertising, I mean, it's an investment mm -hmm. in black radio. Mm -hmm. They're reaching out to black voters with a message that res would resonate mm -hmm. with black voters. Where does that mm -hmm. line exist between misinformation and just old fashioned traditional right. campaigning? And the problem is we can't censor ads we get, unfortunately, because trust, I would be bleeping out stuff all the time. If you could, yes, we can't do that legally. We just cannot period, and we have to offer equal time. It is what it is. And that's but, because of regulations by the government. The government. And what, what ads can be played and when yeah. and how, yes. Well, so we have to do it. But this is where I try to encourage people to be a critical thinker, to really just, because something gets you emotionally. If something can get you an act and get you riled up emotionally, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing that. Well, either that will depress your vote and you'll stay home or you will go away. That might not be beneficial to you as an individual or as a collective group. So this is why I try to encourage people to dig deep, to really look at the facts. And for some people, that's going to be debatable. Well, how do I know this is true? I'm a, I'm a political nerd. You, I'm not a political expert, but I am a nerd. You got to do a lot of reading and research. You got to look at history. You have to look at policies. It is very, very tedious. But even though I'm a radio personality and we're supposed to be music intensive, I care about the community. So whenever I can be of encouragement and give someone a legit source or, well, let me give you pause and let's think of this. I'm not telling you how to think, but I do want you to at least dig a little deeper and not go off the first thing you hear as facts. Because we know political campaigns, of course, they're going to tell you what they want you to know. How many commercials did we see on TV? of somebody in the hood telling black people, your neighborhoods is this, your neighborhoods is that. Well, first of all, black people aren't stupid and we are very pragmatic. So don't come in that direction. Tell me, tell, talk to us about the issues that concern us 
and how you would address it. Not telling us, you keep electing this person, keep doing this. Don't, don't play us like that. I find that really problematic. I want campaigns to do the work for their constituents and whose votes they want to earn, and that goes for every party, but I also want people to do their own research, viable sources, and I know that that sounds very broad and it can be very tough, but as much as I can help someone do that, I want to do that because I want us to be well informed and intentional when we vote. Allison, I want to kick that same question to you. What is the difference between um, fake news and misinformation? And again, what role does new media play in that? What we've, I think, missed in mentioning is that um, former President Donald Trump was masterful in utilizing mm -hmm. Twitter to speak directly to American constituents in a way that we hadn't seen previously. I mean, essentially, he cut out media as the middleman. Oh, yeah. There was no middleman. Mm -hmm. There was no preparation of remarks vetting of those remarks, then going through, you know, your press uh, cohort and, and shop to, to get those remarks, and then a press conference. He would get on Twitter and whatever uh, information he wanted to share with the American public, you got it instantaneously, and it forced media outlets to then chase the information versus being, as uh, Mary mentioned, the gatekeeper of that information. And so while that is, uh, I think, an, a good development and that, for voters on some level, they're hearing it from the horse's mouth. I think mm -hmm. that it also causes issues and mm -hmm. that it makes it easier for misinformation or information that's not truly vetted mm -hmm. or has to be walked back. We saw President Trump having to walk back on some of those remarks or his staff having to walk back some of those remarks and that information. Mm -hmm. how, um, does, how do you uh, view the differences in fake news and, and misinformation and how that spread? This to, to me is intent. Um, I would put kind of uh, fake news and disinformation under the umbrella of somebody intending to distribute information that they know to be false or know to be not entirely truthful, where I see misinformation as like your misinformed aunt posting something on Facebook with um, maybe good intentions, but she just doesn't know what she's mm -hmm. talking about. Um, so I, I think for me the biggest differentiator is intent. Um, I think you know fake news um, is often um, written to be very salacious and grab your attention and make you immediately emotional and angry about something. It's meant to get a reaction out of you um, where I think misinformation, which can be just as damaging, um, is you know potentially more well-meaning people just not, doing their research before they repeat something. And Mary, I will kick the question to you because you've been in this space the longest. I don't know if you remember, but I remember having worked in the uh, campaign uh, space in 2016 at the national level, reporters being put behind walls and in cages and things like that and, oh, yeah. and barred off during the election season or even during moments of unrest and protest, reporters being pushed aside and, and barricaded so that they were not allowed access to yeah. uh, what was going on in real time. And I think that those are factors that play into the type of information that we receive. And your, uh, from your expertise and from where you sit and from your perspective, what is the difference between fake news and misinformation and what factors play into how the information is spread? Well, to, the, to your point of um, the lack of access, the cutting off, and frankly, the Obama administration started some of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can point to Trump all we want, but in all fairness, the Obama administration was not nearly as open. They were far more guarded than other administrations prior in terms of the access to, um, you know, for media. And that, I think, some of it, frankly, I think was because he was the first black president. There was a lot of being careful and knowing that he was going to bear the weight, frankly, of being the first, which is massive. Um, you don't win. And I think that was part of that. But then Trump then later, what you're um, speaking to, was literally cut off access or cut off and would attack certain reporters and point them out in news conferences or never take the question from or start taking questions from news sources that other journalists did not consider credible. Um, managing his own message kind of thing, which 
that's something that I think the public needs to be aware of. What I would also even throw in there, I mean, I absolutely agree, and I think, um, you know, Allison and Julie have, like, talked about misinformation and fake news in, in very real great ways. I would almost say that for the public, though, they need to think about malicious information. Mm -hmm. And granted, you know, I wrote race and immigration and do a lot of policing now. And I just think there are malicious characters, whether they are, we've already seen it, foreign governments, that are, want to see America go at itself, mm -hmm. you know? And we've got to be better than that. And I think choosing your media well can help do that. I listen for dog whistles that aren't even dog whistles anymore on race. Yeah, they're full bullhorns. It's bullhorns, mm -hmm. it's blatant, it's out there. And there's also real subtleties, though, too. Yeah. There are a lot of things about anti-Semitism that have been leaked out. And uh, frankly, young people sometimes pick up on some of this. And they mean to be supportive of um, Palestine in a, a two-state solution. Um, but end up kind of hedging into some things that are actually long-term, centuries-old anti-Semitic tropes. And we just have to be a better society than that because I do see that coming. I personally worry about Latinos being pitted against African Americans when you look at demographics. So there's a lot of things that may not even fit your very good definitions of fake news or misinformation, but it's misused and it's malicious. And it may sound right, it may sound accurate, and maybe at some level, you know, I mean, the definition of a stereotype is it's a grain of truth that's gone crazy. And what I always tell people when we do, you know, studying diversity and inclusion is issues is if you run too far from that grain of truth, you're going to circle right back in and do something even more racist. Mm -hmm. But you have to be knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And I would ask that of the American public and hopefully of media that we can provide that and help. Um, not go to a place that I think we are somewhat by demographics and by some angry voices out there um, poised. I mean, we, uh, January 6th mortified me as someone who's covered issues of, um, you know, going from the Klan to Three Percenters to, you know, Christian Patriot movie, the whole shift of how that happened. There are people that were, have been lying in wait for that. And when the internet came around, they used it to organize in ways that they never could have before. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, when I was at home, I was watching it, I mean, I almost started bawling. It was horrendous. And I knew those officers were in some serious trouble when they started talking about it was breached. I was there in, on January 6th, three blocks mm -hmm. from the Capitol, and could hear it from my window um, and was watching it on television, and I couldn't believe what I was watching and hearing. I ended up catching a flight back to Kansas City for fear of my safety because yes. things had gotten so chaotic. I have never seen such chaos um, in my existence. Outside of 9-11, that is the only event in American history that I can r connect to that in relation. Um, and I was able to, by the grace of God, catch a flight out of DCA, the last flight into Kansas City, and only to get on the plane with minutes to spare, get on and see a plane full of Trump supporters and folks who had likely been at that protest, um, who had desecrated the Capitol, be able to get on a plane and go back home safely as I was leaving to safety. And so, as a black woman, I think about the history of my ancestors in building this country and building the capital and the role that they played and to see it desecrated as it was on that day was also heart it was heartbreaking and I think that all Americans no matter your political yeah. leanings or affiliation should be offended by what we and up in arms what we saw on January 6th um, so thank you for sharing that we have run into the Q&A section uh, of our discussion if you're watching us be sure to email your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. But if there are any questions, we have members of the Student Advisory Board who have been working on this with me for quite some time to get this going. They have a microphone. And at this moment, we will take any questions that we have from the audience or those watching virtually. Hi.
Hi, what do you think about the appearance of these new social medias that are all about like free speech and like no censorship? And what role should like the government take, or is it more of a market situation where like power, like the other companies, should take them off the off the internet? That's a good question. So should the government play a role in um, mandating and governing? social media or mm. should it be the companies and what do we think about the freedom that social media offers up and I'll say quickly I appreciate the freedom that it offers up because it gives yeah. people a space to tell their story and to mm -hmm. uh, document their history in a way that we haven't seen previously uh, what is happening today is, is being documented and mm -hmm. it is coming from the people who experienced it and you didn't have that in the past we don't hear from slaves about their experience mm -hmm. of slavery or civil rights leaders about what they experience. But black people, people of color, anyone for that matter can write their stories and tell their side of the story and get their side of the story out to the masses in the way they hadn't been able to previously because traditional media outlets have served as gatekeepers to information mm -hmm. and they decided when information was actually news and what stories were worth telling, which is why the Kansas City Star has had to mm -hmm. apologize for its reporting they decided what stories were important and at that time they decided that black stories were not. Mm -hmm. And so that history has been lost to us. But with social mm -hmm. media, that history is no longer lost and can be documented. Mm -hmm. I will open that question to anyone that wants to mm -hmm. answer. Well, I think that's the danger of going too far. I mean, you don't want to censor anything. I want to know even some of the most, if we're gonna fight bigotry and hatred, you've got to know where it's living. If you shut it down, and you being whatever that be, government, some entity, I mean, that's, that can cause a fermentation of things that can come back and bite you later. So there's a yin yang with it. I tend to um, come from the perspective of wanting more of a civically engaged society. Um, you know, I have a secondary degree, so maybe I think too much on education as well but I wish that we could start building more of a sense of civic ownership that is there very much in many ways. I mean, that's what you see coming across in some of these forums. Um, but for people just to be smarter so that you can make the decisions. A gatekeeper, I mean, we shouldn't have been the ones making some of those decisions. I shouldn't have had to fight some of the fights that I fought years ago to get some stories about diverse communities in or get, I started writing columns, frankly, because I couldn't say things about race in a normal kind of news context. It was just, it needed to be a much more nuanced conversation, often around issues of race, than what a traditional print news story would offer. That's how I even started in columns. So it was wanting to be a voice and having trouble getting it out there. But I wish that people could just, you know, we could somehow engage more and get younger people, frankly, because as baby boomers are retiring, I mean, there is a huge glut of institutional knowledge. And it's like, we need younger people to be ready and in tune and educated and able to make better decisions, frankly, than some of my generation did, you know? And I am fully supportive of, and I believe that the younger generations will do it better. I really do. Um, but I want to be there to support you as both an individual and as a journalist. Um, and with that, we'll take any other questions from the audience. Looks like we have three. Hi. So regarding, uh, so like in 2016, Trump used Twitter and like regarding his like behavior at the um, at the debates, um, I guess like the best term I can use is like unprofessional or at least less formal. Mm -hmm. um, he found success with it regardless, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think that in the future, like upcoming elections, that this is going to be the new form that debates take and like is this going to be the communication in politics mm -hmm. now? And is it better that it's like more palatable and more like easy to put into clickbait and inch like kind of allow people to start getting more involved in these things? Or is it becoming too simplified and too polarized and too aggressive? We're definitely polarized. And we see right now that some people are trying to follow, particularly in the same party as the former president, um, that they're trying to do that same 
loud, bravado, I'm gonna get extreme as I can. Now, I don't know if it'll quite work for them because he was, love him or hate him, he was quite an original. He did something that hadn't been done. But we see the trend is gonna continue. Um, and I think some people are just getting used to it. But there is a sect of society that is calling it out that does not want that. And I see that with a lot of young people that are able, even though we're going through a lot right now, we see issues from COVID to racism to misogyny. Like Mary said, I think the young people are gonna be the ones to bridge the gap. You're always gonna have a few that are gonna be friends doing whatever, but I think you all are gonna be the ones to say, wait a minute, that's not okay. We don't like this. So you all will be changed in the future. I don't know if it will ever, any of that will be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I hit my microphone. Um, going so so far in the disrespectful behavior I, I can never digest that from anybody i don't care who it is but for some they like that because this person is saying what i've been wanting to say oh look they're representing the real person but it's going to take younger individuals like yourselves who set the standard for what's okay and what's not okay because you know some of us we're engaged and we support you but there's still some of the older people I'm slightly older than you. I think I could, you know, I'm not going to say. <laughs> you might be able to be my daughter, though. <laughs> but we have to also get out of your way, too, and let you guys do what you're called to do for the next generation. Um, it's scary, but it's also exciting to see that change can happen. I think that what you saw in 2016 is what I would dub the era of authenticity between uh, Senator Bernie Sanders and... Mm -hmm. Uh, former President Trump, they represented different facets of authenticity mm -hmm. in that when you watch them, you felt like you could relate to them. And it's this whole theory of the personification of mm -hmm. politicians and that you feel like you could have a beer with them or talk to yeah. them or that they are relatable. And both candidates presented uh, different mm -hmm. versions of that. I think that when you saw Senator Bernie Sanders, although he was at times grumpy and brash and he's significantly mm -hmm. older than the audience that mm -hmm. was drawn to him which was young people they could relate because he was speaking to issues in a way that they mm -hmm. could relate to mm -hmm. and speaking to the issues that were important to them right. I think that on the other hand Trump was authentic in that he said what people wanted to hear whether he actually believed that or not I think could be questioned and I think that comes from him being a, a marketer and a TV mm -hmm. personality. Mm -hmm. Trump was a television personality mm -hmm. and he understood marketing and messaging in a way that most candidates don't understand mm -hmm. that because they are politicians, they are not messengers. They are mm -hmm. not selling a message, a product or an experience. They are trying to create change through public mm -hmm. service. If you look at who Trump's uh, longest uh, lasting uh, operative on his campaign was it was Brad Parscale who was a marketer right. that he had no experience in political campaigning whatsoever he stayed on the campaign from the very beginning to the end and then ended up being Trump's campaign manager and so I say all that to say I think that authenticity will still play a role in 2022 I think that you started to see um, candidates who represented traditional political characteristics start to go that way. I think we, in, during the 2020 campaigns, we saw now President Biden curse or like mm -hmm. use, you know, very brash language. We saw other candidates use oh, curse man. words, you know, like even Senator Sanders, you know, we're sick of your damn emails. Yeah. I don't know that I'd ever yeah. <laughs> before that saw a politician use a cuss word like and right. someone of his age. It's like, oh, wow. Um, so I think you're starting to see some of that shift. Um, but I do think that it speaks to a desire from people to see authenticity. Um, and hopefully it doesn't go. But I hope it doesn't go too far. But Michelle, and I, you, you made me think of something. Because remember, people thought Hillary Clinton saw him. Yeah. She was too uppity uh -huh. and she wasn't relatable. And like Mary said, the whole likable, which makes me roll my eyes because women get that. So the authenticity, the everyday person wants to see themselves. The everyday Joe, wasn't it like Joe the plumber? Mm -hmm. What was he, 2016? Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So people, yeah, you're going to continue to see that. But I still think the barometer of what is acceptable in the future is going to be up to you guys. 
at that point, what you want to see. And you do want to see somebody who's real. I mean, politicians to a degree, most of them, they go, I don't want, I don't want to be harsh and say lies, they're going to lie to, to a degree. But you do want to see as much authenticity as possible, but it's a matter of what is harmful, what is acceptable. And I think I want to yeah. see my politician or my public servant, I don't, I want to see myself in them or that they can speak to my issues, but I don't want to see myself in them. And that, <laughs> like, I want you to be smarter right. than me. I right. want you to you be <laughs> more well-versed. I want to know that you're putting in the work that I would never put in, which is why I never yeah. signed up for public service. And so I hope to see mm -hmm. that that level of uh, expectation that we have for public servants to be well-versed, to be thoughtful, to, to do the research, to be knowledgeable doesn't go away as we see yeah. more of their personality show through. We had a couple more questions and we've got a little bit of time. I think we can take a couple questions if they're quick, mm -hmm. this gentleman here. And then I think we had someone, yes, over here. Um, thank you for the conversation. If you were mortified by January 6, which I was, mm -hmm. you should have seen what was done to Palestinian children in Gaza by Israeli warplanes with mm -hmm. US weaponry in May or children in Afghanistan a few weeks ago. I'll return to that in terms of proportionality and wisdom in relationship to malicious information. But two questions. Do, in, I'm sort of buoyed by the, by the talk of podcasting and that maybe part of our problem is um, soundbite information mm -hmm. and that people are actually drawn, the average man and women are drawn to long form conversations of deep issues. Is that one possibility that, that mm -hmm. journalists and people in the press can cultivate the desire for long form conversation? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the other potential solution here I think is, is for journalists and people in the press to fill in the gaps around questions of intelligence and counterintelligence and this question of malicious infor information. One of the things that I would do with my son when we used to drive to school was tr turn the channel and talk about the source and, and talk about the nature of the information and yeah. to read the landscape of sourcing both as a journalist but also as your own grassroots intelligence mm -hmm. officer, father, AKA. So That's would right. you address those possibilities? Thank you. challenge that we are facing in traditional media is figuring out how to get people to pay attention to different forms of long form information. I think podcasts have been incredibly successful. I know I was listening to a podcast on my way over here about the Elizabeth Holmes trial. Um, and I listened to like, to all, I've listened to a bunch of audiobooks on Theranos because I find it fascinating. I, and Mary can probably speak to this as well. The analytics for like an online news article do not show that people stay in the article to the degree that they will stay with a podcast. So I, um, I think one of the things that um, newspapers are, are trying to figure out is how to replicate the success of podcasts in written form. Does that look like you know, publishing a five-part series instead of one really long article or, um, you know, finding ways to tell stories with the written word, with video, with photo galleries, et cetera. I think that that's something that newspapers, or at least the newspapers that I've worked for, have not yet figured out to the degree that podcasters have. Um, and can I have you repeat your second question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So what role can journalists play in pinpointing um, good information and, and good intelligence versus, yeah. okay.
So how do we use the skills that counterintelligence, counterintelligence professionals utilize to analyze information and bring that um, to, to journalism or mass communications in the way that your fellowship does with, um, yeah, an analysis uh, and tactics from the medical and uh, aviation sectors? talking about is uh, the John Jay School of Criminal Justice is looking at, like say if an airline went down in TSB, how they would go is they would go in and recreate everything about it. Everything from the starting point of when that plane was being manufactured to everything that occurred. It's a little bit like detective work as well, but it's looking at an issue in the very holistic way. What you're asking is, and you pointed to you know, some global issues, I think you're starting to see that more and that I think good media can do more forums. Um, if people are, you need to get people in a comfortable space where they can actually listen, when they're ready to listen. When they're not, when people are in an emotional state, they're not listening. I mean, it, it, some of it gets into even physiologically of where your, your body is. So how can media help with that role? And you mentioned issues with Palestine and um, Afghanistan. We're perfect here in this location for, I mean, A, the Dole Institute has been very good for these types of forums, what we're doing right now. But the largest Afghan studies center is in Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, the sources that I've used, that I started on right after September 11th, I was up there immediately. The guy who had bin Laden as his dossier for um, the State Department just retired. He was head of it at that point. You have the Truman Library. Um, I can speak a little bit, I'll, you know, gloat with, uh, Kansas City PBS is trying to move even more into that space of being a convener. You know, just as like radio, you have call in and people and you'll have a long form of having um, the mayor on. And actually I know they're gonna tape tomorrow morning. Um, Nick Haynes is with the whole show for Week in Review. It's, you know, I got told, okay, you don't have to show up tomorrow, Mary. Um, because it'll be Mayor Quentin Lucas. That's a whole broad forum. I think offering that sort of space is really good and it can help move people away from the clickbait that I frankly see because you've got to, I mean, if you're, as a reporter, if you're being judged by the number of, not only the number of clicks that your story gets, but if someone clicks and then subscribes, that is how some reporters are being judged. I completely understand how traditional mainstream print media got to that space, and I understand the financials that are pushing it, but that also changes the type of journalism. It changes the headline that they put on things. It changes how they approach it, whether people will admit it or not, and many won't admit it right now. But the, the workplace cultural shift that occurs within journalism is a real thing, and we're still navigating through it but I think you can reward good journalism, show up at those kind of forums, ask for them. Um, frankly, personally, I would support that because I think that's where people can really learn and engage with someone who is different from them in a way and filter out the, well, what was, is that just your perception? Okay, so you met one person who was Jewish and this is what you thought, or you met one person from Palestine and now this is what you think of all of it? Well, did you know, you know? That's where, you, that's where you people learn and grow and connect and you build community, which is what good journalism should always support, is community. I think that's a good way to close out. We have run out of time. In this age of new media and being assaulted with so much information, Thomas Friedman in his book said, uh, the world is flat. He said that as people get more access to information that doesn't necessarily make them more informed because they gravitate to the information channels that confirm what they already think. So I challenge you all to go outside of those channels that confirm what you think. And in closing, I will give you all just five seconds, name off one or two news sources that people can check when they want good information on what's happening in American politics and government particularly in 2022. Allison, what's one or two that people mm. should check out? 
Um, I am pretty partial to the New York Times um, yeah. as well as NPR. I'll try and give you two mediums there. Well, there you go. <laughs> what about you, Julie? I like New York Times as well. I, I'm, I'm a nerd, so I, I'll do anything. USA Today, I've checked out The Independent, Kansas City Star. I just read, and that's what I advise, read. All right, mm -hmm. what about you, Mary? I would throw in PBS. I mean, they have a, there are many, many platforms, yeah. digital, online. Uh, the TV, radio, good. their, their, their awesome. documentary ability is very good. Those independent lens do a lot of international reporting. And then there's also input ways for people to come in from a community level. Okay. And for me, all of these channels and Bloomberg News. I prefer I, I to watch, watch Bloomberg, Bloomberg News. during Reuters. the election yes. cycle. Yes. I did watch Bloomberg. Get the business and the politics. If you could all join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists for their great discussion today. Thank you to the Dole Institute for hosting this discussion series, What's the Matter with American Politics? We have to give a very special thank you to Newman's own foundation. They are supporting this uh, entire fellowship program and have for a number of years. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. To learn more about Shirley's Kitchen Cabinet, you can visit our website at www.shirleyskitchencabinet.org. And be sure to join us next week, same time, same place, a discussion about what it takes, uh, what are the shifts in political identity today uh, will take place. We'll have uh, leaders from each political uh, party and, and yeah, ideology represented. Uh, you can come late to this discussion. You can even leave early. Just make sure you don't miss out. Thank you for joining us.